This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Welcome, listeners, to The Edge, Trek FM's dedicated podcast to Star Trek Discovery. I'm your host, Amy Nelson, and with me as he is every time, Patrick Devlin. Patrick, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, How are you today? I am doing great, enjoying the summer and enjoying really talking about these characters, and we have a great one for today. Yeah, this one should be exciting. I I was looking forward to getting to this one, and, and here we are. Yes. And with us today, we have the lovely Clara Cook from Primitive Culture. Clara, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for having me, Amy. It's an absolute pleasure. I have never been on the edge before, so this is a first time for me. So tell me, uh, how did you enjoy Discovery? What were your thoughts about it? I At first, it took us some time to get used to because it is quite different than other Star Trek series. Yeah. But I actually love it. I loved the production values, loved the acting, thought the music was really good. And I love the sort of nods back to other series and the nods back to Enterprise and nods back to the original series. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Very, very good. Yeah, it's been so fun uh, talking about it and doing postcards. And and so, yeah, just these character deep dives. And today we are going to be talking about Captain Philippa Giorgio. So um, let's start with your initial thoughts uh, about Captain Philippa. Uh, Clara, why don't you start us off? So I really love her as a character. I think it's great to see a strong woman in power, um, in a position of authority. I also think it's great that she's also a um, person of color as well. So she's got a Malaysian background, which is really good. I like the fact that she's kept her Malaysian accent um, when she's speaking, which sort of emphasizes the international makeup of the crew of the Discovery. Well, sorry, Shenzhou. But I also really like her command style. It's sort of, she's quite casual. You know, she allows the, there to be banter between her her, um, her crew on the bridge. So I really like that. But she's also very firm and very confident in her authority. And she's, I mean, it was sad, sad that she died so so soon yeah. into, the, into the series because she really is a really interesting, fantastic character. And her relationship with Burnham was actually a really interesting, complex relationship. So it it is sad that she died so early on. But yeah, so it means we get Mira Giorgio, which is also really great. Yeah. Patrick, what did you think of Giorgio? So I, I was really looking forward to talking about her because we actually have two of her. You know, we have the Prime Universe and the Mirror Universe versions. And I loved, in the beginning, I loved her relationship with Burnham, the the motherly figure that, you know, has to put her foot down at some point early on, we see, um, and how that doesn't really work out for her. But um, I, I agree with Clara that I really like her command style. She's She can be firm, but she can let them kind of go and do their own thing. But then when she decides what the right plan of action is, she expects them to listen and just carry it out. So uh, I really enjoyed her. And I really actually enjoyed the, uh, the mirror universe version of her better than the original, probably because we got to see her more, yeah. you know, just because we got more about her. And it, it also, it allowed us to see um, Burnham's relationship with the prime universe version again in a different way. Yeah. We definitely with her, like we have prime and then we have mirror and then we have mirror within the prime. So like her character, man, she's all over all these different universes. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens to her. I'm very excited. And yeah, when I, you know, we get to meet her the very first episode, you know, the first two 
And I really was drawn to her. I thought she was, uh, yeah, just so compassionate, but still firm and love to have this uh, female captain again uh, being introduced. And, and like you said, Clara, like she kept her accent and that there was some criticism um, with some of the other actors, Sh- Shazad Latif specifically, where how come we didn't, how come it's all this Americanized or Jason Isaacs? How come it's this American accent? And so I, I appreciated that she did bring uh, that diversity, not only in her appearances, but, you know, how she talks with her accent and everything. So, all right. Well, let's um, get into it because we meet her and she's captain of the Shenzhou. And so what do you think specifically about her command style? Um, is this a typical Starfleet captain? Is this atypical? Um, and then maybe compare and contrast to some of the other captains that we've seen previously. Clara? Well, I think a lot of people will make the comparison with Janeway simply because they're both women. But I actually think she's very different than Janeway. I think her command style is much more like Kirk's, actually. I think she's more senior than Burnham, but she treats Burnham very much like an equal. I know there's this mother-daughter relationship between the two of them, but when you first see them together in the first scene in the first episode, there's a lot of like kind of casual communication between the two of them, as if they are almost on the same level, even though one of them's a superior officer and one of them's a junior officer. And that's very much kind of what happens with Kirk and Spock, so... Kirk treats Spock very much like an equal, despite the fact that he has to tell him what to do and give him orders, and Spock has to obey those orders. I also think that she's she has got this kind of like element of maybe slightly more th- thinking outside of the box kind of command style as well. Like she sort of st- she she trusts Burnham um, even when Burnham's saying stuff to her that's quite outlandish. About initially they don't know the the Klingons are there in the binary star th- um, system, so she has to trust Burnham's word. And I think some of the other captains would need scientific proof. Perhaps maybe Picard would be more skeptical. She's obviously very intelligent and very good at her job and very highly decorated. And she's, and she's fine to let the, the members of her crew tease each other, but she does put a stop to it when it starts to interfere with the jobs. And she, and she is also very confident in her authority. When she makes the decision, she expects people to follow it. And if someone challenges her leadership, She's very quick to put them down and say, no, I'm the captain. Yeah. And just going off with what you said, like, you know, I'm always going to think about the Picard and how you're like, well, Picard would need more evidence and stuff. But I see similarities between uh, Giorgio and Picard because she, she seems to be very more diplomatic, um, you know, and even with that, recommendation from Burnham. It's like, we need to attack first. Like, no, we need to, you know, open up lines of communication and, you know, do more of the diplomacy uh, to try and bridge the gap and not go in with force. And so that to me, like really spoke uh, to something what Picard. And so I saw her as just this very normal, average, and not that this is a bad thing, but you just a normal Starfleet captain that we have seen previously. And, and you're right. She, Janeway, in my opinion, also is, is similar to Picard where she wants to, you know, do uh, the diplomacy, but definitely Janeway's very willing to take the action that is needed to probably a little bit more than Picard. And so, yeah, I see George O similar to Janeway with that way that, yeah, she's going to take action. She's going to do what she needs to do in that respect. Uh, Patrick, what did you think of her as captain? So obviously compared to Lorca, she's a very typical Starfleet captain, right? But I don't think that's necessarily true overall. But I, if I was going to compare her to somebody, I would actually compare her a lot to Cisco because mm-hmm. Cisco got himself into a war by, you know, well, he didn't, but Starfleet got him into a war and she, she seems like the type that would do similar things that he would like when he leaves behind the baseball to taunt the other, the, the, um, uh, the Cardassian, sorry. Um, I see her as being able to, to pull those kind of things off because she, she kind of sees outside the box like he did. She, she comes up with plans that maybe no one else would have. Um, 
So I, I see her a little bit, a little bit of Cisco mixed in there, and I would agree also a little bit of Kirk. I don't see so much Picard and Janeway, only because they just seem, especially Picard was way too by the books for me. I mean, he <laughs> I, and I loved him when watching him and everything, but he's way too by the books to be in Georgia. Mm. And Janeway was very much modeled off of the way they wrote Picard. So yeah. 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 And like you were talking about Clara, like she has a very good familiarity with her crew, but yet knows when to draw the line. And I love that about a leader and I love seeing it in a captain. Um, and again, going back to Picard, like Picard didn't have as much of a familiarity. I think Giorgio has uh, a better relationship with her crew and she is jibing with them a little bit back and forth. And, you know, I just, I loved seeing the interaction that she has with her crew because that automatically we know that the crew trusts her and that she trusts the crew, you know, that they have worked through you know, and even though we're just meeting them at the very first time, but because of that relationship, we know that they have been on a lot of missions together, that they've worked through, that they, you know, really do trust one another and are willing to, you know, stake their lives and go on these different missions, you know, knowing that they are in the best possible hands. Oh, she also does this thing where she allows the crew to openly question her on the bridge in front of each other. So particularly with Saru, I've noticed that quite a few times in the first ep two episodes, he says things that aren't maybe necessarily like directly questioning her orders, but he sort of says something like, you know, should we wipe out an alien's cultural civilization or whatever, when they're talking about firing on the sarcophagus ship. So right. he does, he does question what they're doing and she allows him to do that. And mm -hmm. he does it in front of the bridge crew, which you could see, I would say maybe a less confident person, a less confident captain would see that as undermining their leadership. But right. she's quite confident in her authority. So she's okay with letting people question her decisions. And she's also okay with taking advice from other people. And that's the sign of a really good captain. Yeah. And a great leader. Yeah. So to go back to something you said, though, Amy, um, that she's clearly more comfortable with her crew than Picard is. Is it really a fair comparison? Because we do pick up here with them being together for quite a while whereas Picard we pick up the very first episode he has not even met what Riker yet so you know it, it's very different where she handpicked her bridge crew when he was just kind of assigned them by the end don't we see him more like her yes. than we do in the beginning yes I that is a very good point and very fair to not make the comparisons like from season one um, yeah so they yeah Giorgio's crew has been together for a while. So if we look at Picard later in the seasons, um, there is that familiarity with that. So good point, Patrick. <laughs> Defending your TNG for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so what do you think about um, like her unwilling desire for this diplomacy and just not wanting to to attack the Klingons first and just following Starfleet's protocol. I mean, it's obviously, as you said, to her detriment. So, yeah, my personal take on this is it's just uh, Starfleet ideals to a fault. You know, you can only hold on to a, an ideal as long as it'll, it'll serve the greater good. Otherwise, it's not really an ideal then. And... If it's going to wipe out your civilization, your ideals are going to be lost anyway. And this is one of those where you know the outcome is going to be war. I mean, everyone could see it except for Georgiou because she wanted to believe in the ideals. I think we're supposed to think that she's got... Um, I think we're supposed to think that she's had some sort of experience in the past with warfare because she says that line to Michael when they're in the ready room, like that war isn't a simulation, war is blood and funerals and screams right. so i think i supposed to think she's had some sort of traumatic incident in her past and i think that's a little bit also why sarek sort of tries to well why sarek puts michael on the shenzu because i think he thinks that georgie because of her past and also burnham because of her past 
will be able to connect in that respect, I think. So I haven't read any of the tie-in novels, and I know that she uh, it, is actually uh, one of the characters in the tie-in novels. So maybe they explain that further in the tie-in novels, if either of you have read them. But I think she's supposed to have had experience of warfare, and she knows how devastating it can be, so she's trying to prevent it as much as possible. So Desperate Hours does have a, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it a war, but it does have a battle that she's in. But I believe there was a time when she... They made mention of the actual war she was in. I just can't remember what it was, but she was in. She was definitely in a war. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm only about halfway through Desperate yeah, Hours still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it, guys. Um, but yeah, definitely that altercation there. Um, you can see the pain. Well, I I won't give away the thing, but she definitely sees. Uh, the results of, you know, getting into altercations. And so I just, it just makes me, you know, question sometimes like, so you have these Starfleet orders and these protocols on how we're supposed to, you know, interact. And, and it's just, I wish I could see more within Starfleet captains that it's, this is a case by case scenario. The ideal would be, yes, let's open up diplomacy, let's start communication. Um, but, you know, so many times um, we see, especially like in, in Enterprise, you know, that it's not going to be the best case scenario. And uh, I think that in this scenario with meeting the Klingons and knowing what the Vulcans know and just sort of learning from their past, like, Definitely would have been better had she listened to Burnham and and the past experiences with the Vulcans. And I just feel like that Starfleet sort of boxed her in a little too much. And I don't blame her. I sort of blame that with Starfleet. Right. So, absolutely. So, th to me, this is a complete systems failure by Starfleet because mm -hmm. the Vulcans are in Starfleet. So, how come their experience with the Klingons isn't being factored in at all into the decisions of running in the Klingons? Because we hear... No one's seen Klingons for a hundred years. Well, that's great, except that when Sarek talks about it, it's obvious the the Vulcans know how to handle them. Yeah. So why doesn't all of Starfleet know how to handle them? I also don't understand how Klingons can't have been seen for hundred hundreds of years, but yet somehow Michael's witnessed the her parents being killed by Klingons. We're correct. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, oh. I mean, she didn't see them. She was hiding in a cupboard, but but they killed them. Yeah. yeah. So it's like. We know that Klingons are uh, warlike Real. and aggressive, yeah, and they're going to kill. Well, we people. know they're at that point. People think of them as like you know folklore. They yeah. don't even think of Klingons as real, but they were in Enterprise, right? So they have to exist. But more importantly, they killed Burnham's parents, so they have to exist. Right? Why is there this belief that they're not? They don't exist. It doesn't make much sense. And Sarek obviously talks about them as if these every time we fly by them, we shoot them happened somewhat recently yeah very true. i think i think the star trek is all about rebellion though isn't it i mean in every single series there's always a captain or a starfleet officer who breaks the rules and actually in, in all the movies too it's always about rebellion and it's a, it's a strange contradiction between being part of this collective force with a common goal and you know, with the biggest rule of all, like the prime directive, although in exactly. Discovery, they call it something else, don't they? Rule number one or something. General, General Order One, which is what it yeah. was originally. Um, yeah, and then it becomes the prime directive. I don't know prime why directive, they changed which it. Yeah. I think it's a, a very fancy way of putting it, really. But yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's always being broken. They're breaking it left, right, and center. They talk about not breaking it, but they break it all the time. And then they yes. also rebel all the time. So... When there was going to be a mutiny in Discovery, right at the beginning, I, I was not surprised. I was like, this is classic, classic Star Trek. The actual, the thing that's not classic about it is that she actually serves a punishment for it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, it, you don't ever see, like everyone mutinies all the time. And it's just like, oh, well, the outcome was good. So good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll put a <laughs> reprimand in your file. That only happens a couple times, you know? Right. So, and then we never see those whales? files. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you saved whales. Okay, we'll forgive you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, they didn't just save whales; they That's saved true. the planet too. <laughs> but but they did it coming back on a Klingon bird of prey. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, so when we so then 
Captain Philippa, she dies. Uh, and so we go through quite a few episodes and then we get introduced back to uh, not her, but Emperor uh, Giorgio in the Mirror Universe. So um, it, were you surprised to see her as Emperor Clara? No. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, Very so I want to know. No. So you weren't I was surprised, pleased, but not surprised. I knew okay, she was going. So, I knew she was going to be emperor. I knew it. So how did you know? Did you know because you follow Trek FM, or did you know like as a fan separate? You know what I mean with all the social media and all the speculation that had happened. You know, I think a lot of it was speculation on social media, but also Michelle Yeoh is a really famous actress. And she's also really, really good. And she, I just can't imagine that they would hire her for two episodes. I just thought she's going to have to come back. And it, it's, it would, it's prime character development and character conflict for Burnham to come across basically the woman who mentored her and treated her like a daughter, but in the mirror universe. I mean, it's just painful. It's just painful. And Star Trek does that. They, they take, you know, they take, the mirror universe characters that people know and love and they twist them. And so I thought Giorgio is a, a fantastic captain. It's, 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 it's going to be really exciting to take her and twist her and make her a despicable human being. And that's what they did. <laughs> yeah. Patrick. Yeah, no, I, I, I had a feeling it was going to be her. I tried not to follow like social media and stuff because I didn't want people's opinions ruining how I watched the show, but it was hard to miss a lot of the people talking about that, but I, I just felt like Clara said, it just made sense that she would be the emperor, especially since they kind of led up to it in such a secretive way in that first episode. You know, they, they talked about it and wouldn't let you see anything. And, and then the, the reveal just, it made sense that she would be the one who was the emperor. Cause it kind of had to be um, her or Lorca, in my opinion, was going to have to be it. And now we know Lorca was already here. So, it, yeah, it, it I'm, I'm sort of dense when it comes to speculating things. And so I just, I had no idea. And of, I, of course, was doing postcards. And so I was definitely involved with uh, the social media side of it. And so hearing everyone's speculation, uh, I wasn't surprised. But man, I would not have come up with that on my own. <laughs> I'm just being completely honest with you. <laughs> So, uh, what did you think of Emperor Philippa Giorgio in the Mirror Universe? Uh, com like, her command style there. I mean, especially when she, like, takes out her, what was it, her comm badge or something? And psh, just kills everyone right there in the circle. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was crazy. It, she's the perfect Mirror Emperor. I mean, she plays it perfectly. They wrote it perfectly. She has no problem killing people to gain even a little tiny bit, and she's ready to wage war, and even if it's going to end her emperorship. She's got some of the same characteristics as the prime Philippa. So some of the good things about Philippa, prime Philippa, like the fact that she's brave, the fact that she's uh, confident in her authority and her leadership, and the fact that she's inventive and she thinks outside the box – those also exist in Mirror, Philippa, in the Emperor, but they're sort of ex sort of made more extreme. So they become actual faults rather than virtues, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. the fact that, that she's so good at thinking outside the box means that she's quite nefarious and she can come up with all sorts of horrible schemes or she can, she can think one step ahead of the next person and execute them. I thought it was really funny, not funny, but sort of weird, a, a, a good contrast that she was actually eaten by Klingons. And then later the emperor in the mirror universe is shown eating a Kelpian. I was just saying oh, I, either nice. side of either universe is the species are munching on each other. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> one way. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I too, uh, liked her command style in, uh, the mirror universe. Uh, she definitely commanded respect and she, it seemed like, even though we didn't see it, but it just seemed like she had this army of followers behind her. Like she was in control and we didn't see all the people that were following her 
but her presence, like when she walks in a room or when we, you know, walk into her room, like, and, and we had that in prime with, you know, prime Giorgio, but like mirror Giorgio, she was just awesome. And I'm not, I mean, is that Michelle Yeoh? I mean, because to me, it was just so obvious that Emperor Giorgio was the lead, the command. Everyone respected her. And it, I just totally give credit to Michelle Yeoh for making those just slight differences between the two characters that uh, Emperor Giorgio, in my opinion, was just so much more powerful, you know? Well, that's, that's the key, right, for, for Michelle Yeoh is that she had to make the characters very similar and yet completely different mm-hmm. all at the same time. Because if if they were too far apart from each other, it's not believable. And if they're too similar, it's not believable either. There's like a very fine range in which you can land th- both those characters that it makes sense to the viewer. And she nailed both of them perfect. Yeah. And it's also about what both those characters ultimately respect and hold up in high regard. And um, the prime Giorgio... Um, she respects like humanity and empathy and diplomacy and the mirror Giorgio respects strength and authority and decisiveness. So it's what the two, their outlooks are quite different as well. You know, though they have some, they share a lot of the same characteristics. It's ultimately what they're going to do when they're faced with a situation that is different. And mirror Giorgio is just going to be a lot more ruthless. She's going to do something immoral and prime Giorgio is going to be more diplomatic and try to adhere to the principles of Starfleet. So they, in a way, the two of them actually embody this conflict that happens in most of Star Trek, actually, between following your morals and doing what is the right thing to do, following the Federation, following the Starfleet's core values, and then getting the job done. And in the end she's going to get the job done in the prime universe, which is why Sarek and Admiral Cornwall um, want to use her because her ruthlessness is going to get the job done in a war. You know, she would end the war with the Klingons and she would do it by killing all the Klingons. But is that really what Starfleet should be about? And the prime Giorgio would never have done that. So they're kind of the two, two sides of them are like this kind of conflicting debate about what you do in a time of war. Yeah. And that's what I love about Discovery is that we are seeing, I think more so in this series than any other series, like both sides of the conflict. Like we see it with Burnham, we see it with, you know, Captain and Emperor Giorgio, like Prime Mirror Universe. I just, I think it tells the story so well and allows and has enough time to develop both sides of the conflict that we're seeing, whether that be, like you said, the moral versus the, the selfishness and, or the different sides of a war, like we get to take the time to see and then decide for ourselves, like what would we do in that, in those situations? Yeah, I like that. Okay, so um, we've talked about uh, Captain Giorgio and how she's this mentor figure to Burnham. And then we also see the exact same scenario in the mirror universe, how she's like this mother figure uh, to Burnham. So do you think that was good that they had such similarities between the two universes, Clara? Yeah, I actually think that the relationships are slightly different though. I think the um, mentor relationship in the prime universe is perhaps still very emotion emotionally charged, but it's much more of a professional mentorship relationship because of the fact that Burnham already has an adoptive parent, which is Sarek. But in the mirror universe, it's implied that the emperor actually did see Michael as her daughter. So she adopted her, like, an, like her actual daughter. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of very passionate love there. And it's, I would say that love is more intense and more strong. And that's maybe, but maybe that's the emperor is just a more intensely feeling person. I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily true. But I think that it's good that they have the, the two sort of relationships contrasting 
in the two different universes. I do have a little bit of a problem with mirror universes and this idea that everybody in one universe kind of is sort of connected to each other in another universe. It all seems a little bit convenient. I don't know how mirror universes supposedly would work scientifically, but is that actually possible? I mean, is it possible that in a mirror universe right now that we're all talking to each other on a podcast or would we all be podcasting with different people? Right. (laughs) Yeah. That was sort of my question. Like there's such a mentorship between the two. Like why, yeah. Why is that happening? Patrick? I have an answer. I have an answer. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I have a scientific answer. I was reading something. I can't, I can't source it now. Um, so when this drops, I'll try and post the article, but so there's a theory in, multi-dimensional uniform uh, universe is that we're all like sheets of paper stacked side by side so let's just say we're in the middle of the stack Mm -hmm. if you go two or three over basically we're all talking right now and one of us is cursing and that's the only difference right but as you get farther down the stack of sheets it gets farther and farther apart where we wouldn't even know each other and nothing we don't even look like humans you know so so my thought is that this mirror universe would be one maybe two universes away Oh, okay. Not, oh, so not it's too a far. close mirror universe. Right. So the closer the universes are, the more similarities there are to the point where if you jumped from us to say, like, let's just say we're universe A and we jump to B, you might not even know that you moved. Mm-hmm. And you, you might have to get to 10, 20, 30 before you even start realizing differences or run across yourself in those other universes. That would tell you. But so, so it, it makes sense to me that they would be that similar. We must have jumped, if that's the theory they're going with, then we must have jumped quite a few universes over, right? Because if it was right next to this universe, then she would still have Klingon parents. Mm-hmm. B- Burnham would. Georgia wouldn't be her mother. So that's where they kind of start to lose it because they go that far, but then they but then it's not rain it back. Right. So, yeah. But I guess there's probably a number in which that works if you talk to physicists, but I'm not one. <laughs> So, but, but that is a, a somewhat of an answer as to why you would have a very similar relate. Everyone is basically the same and that your DNA doesn't change really between the two universes is because they're so close that there is really no differences. So is the Terran Empire and the Mirror Universe in Discovery the same Mirror Universe that we see in the other Star Trek series? It is. I believe so. It is, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, unless they tell us different later, as far as I can see it. It's supposed to be exactly the same, but they, they kind of expanded on the mirror universe now, right? Like they didn't give us as much information before this. No, how that's it's run, true. How it works. So, so I, I think that's a good thing. And, um, you know, it, it really all falls under, under bringing this back to Georgia. It, a lot of this falls under her and her reactions to stuff. But I think the reason why you have the mother daughter connection so much stronger is, Burnham in Prime Universe doesn't show emotions, but that would not be true of a Burnham in the Mirror Universe who didn't have a Sarek as a father. Oh. That's true. That's really true. Yeah. She wouldn't have been raised by Vulcans. So, even though we don't... Right. So if we don't see... We don't see Burnham, but Burnham's m- use of, of uh, emotion more would... You'd see that reflected back from Georgiou, wouldn't you? Right. I would yeah. think. Yeah. And I think Georgiou has... This. Now I'm saying Georgiou. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to put that Just in as close Philippa. to you as you can. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. never made that mistake before. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I think you're right. Like, Georgiou, um getting that reciprocal emotion from Mir Burnham, that that's going to build this stronger mother-daughter type of relationship that that we see Georgiou have towards towards Burnham. Right. Yeah. And and I think being confronted with her her you know our prime her mirror version mm-hmm. would would bring up some of those emotions again and possibly even stronger because this one didn't screw her yet. Yeah. Yeah, and also uh, Giorgio makes it very clear that um not only did her Burnham mirror Burnham betray her emotionally you know as like a mother and daughter like betrayed her mother but she also betrayed her sort of politically as well didn't she 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 sides with the guy who's going to Lorca who's going to mount a rebellion for a while there I thought Lorca was gonna instill a more moral better Terran empire just for a second I was like he's gonna set all the Kelpians free and then yeah no <laughs> yeah I was like that, that would but he's still bastard <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so it's funny you say that because I haven't heard anyone else say that at all. <laughs> and I thought it for like a, a quick second in there and I was like, that'd be stupid. <laughs> I mean, it would, it would be nice, but it yeah. would be stupid because now, then we can't just kill him and move on. Oh. Well, well, you know that's not going to happen because the mirror universe and Deep Space Nine, like they're just as hideous, really, aren't they? Actually, I think maybe the humans are enslaved then. I don't know. What's interesting to me, though, is that in the Prime Universe, the Klingons are concerned about the Federation encroaching on their territory. They're concerned about sort of like creeping authoritarianism from the Federation. And actually, it's not the case. But in the mirror universe, it is the case because the Terrans are decimating alien populations and yes. is, yeah, being authoritarian. Yeah. So I thought that was quite yeah. funny, really. <laughs> not funny, but ironic. Yeah, again, she has my contrast. sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for you. So in mirror universe, Burnham makes the choice to inform Philippa that this is a mirror universe. Like, what was it that you think uh, Burnham saw in this Philippa that led her to trust her enough with this explosive information? She just saw Philippa. She didn't. She didn't see Mira Philippa. She just mm. saw Philippa and hoped that there was enough of Prime in Mira to bring her back to Prime. But we know that's not going to happen, right? I mean, as the viewer, you know that's not going to happen. But I guess she has to try. Yeah. I was hoping that she saw that there was still the relationship and probably maybe even a little bit more than uh, what Burnham had with Prime, Giorgio. Uh, so I was thinking maybe that she saw that there was such a strong relationship in the mirror that she would take that chance and hope that their relationship in the mirror universe was as stronger, if not stronger, for uh, Giorgio to trust her. She continues to hope that Giorgio, mirror Giorgio, is got a bit of prime Giorgio in her. I mean, she even continues to hope for that till the very end of the series. And it's not until the very, very end where she's like, this woman is definitely not the woman I knew. And to the point where she's actually, but she's, I think she sort of plays her a little bit because Mira, she sort of believes that Mira Giorgio, even though she knows Burnham isn't the same Burnham as her Burnham, she's still emotionally connected to her. So in a way, Burnham's hoping that Mira Giorgio is like her own Giorgio and Mira Giorgio is hoping that prime Burnham is like her Burnham. So at the very end when she says, well, you can shoot me. You know, are you willing to shoot me? She's playing on her her emotions. And Mira Giorgio can't shoot Prime Burnham because she looks exactly like her daughter. So the entire time they're kind of trying to sort of feel each other out. Are they the same person? There's things about them that are similar. They look the same. They have some of the same mannerisms. They have some of the same sort of characteristics. But it's really towards the end that they both realize that they're completely different people. And that they kind of have to reconcile with that. That ending drives me crazy. <laughs> when she says, it does, because she says, you'll have to kill me again, or uh, you'll, so, I don't know, something like that. But you'll have to watch me die again, or something along the way. Because so she never watched her die in the first place. And they just talked about that like 15 minutes earlier, how she didn't see her die. So it drives me crazy. But yes, the, the, the <laughs> point they were trying to write in makes sense. Oh, I didn't catch that. That's funny, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, if you watch like the last episode, like there's just there's statements that they make in it. Giorgio didn't know that Burnham was Mira Burnham at first. Uh, not Mira Burnham at first. So she did, obviously didn't watch her die, right? And she's like, you'll have to watch me die again. No, I won't. <laughs> you know? I think she uh, means like the emotional impact of having someone that looks I like guess. a daughter die again. Uh, <laughs> oh, there I think, you go. I think that, yeah, but, her, but she didn't see her daughter die. I think part of the problem is that we don't really know what happened to Mira Burnham, do we? It's right. oh my Not god! Maybe she'll appear. Maybe she'll appear and see. I hope he doesn't, though. I hope they. I know. I know. I can't. I mean, I, I I liked the Mirror Universe for season one, but I hope they go to new places in season two. Well, she could no, but she could appear without having to go to Mirror Universe. That's true. She could be because she could have come over with Lorca, right, and then disappeared out into the universe, into a Prime Universe, and she could just reappear later on to try and take up you know Lorca's mantle again. 
output. Hmm. Yeah, because it never was really said where Mir uh, Burnham was. Well, they they tell you she died trying to catch Lorca. So the assumption is that she died when Lorca jumped to the Prime Universe. So oh. it's possible. But, it, you know, hey, this is like a soap opera. No body. It didn't happen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever really dies <laughs> no not at all <laughs> yeah so I too am not a big fan of the ending with Giorgio I did not like and I still don't like the fact that uh, Burnham grabs her uh, and we get Mir Giorgio in the prime and you're right the, it, still uh, Burnham's like in her mind thinking, this is my Philippa, this is, and it's not, it's not. And I'm just, again, very upset that she's going to go. And then what's the last thing? Try and be good. What? Are you kidding me? (laughs) You're going to let this person go with the words, try and be good. Well, look, I mean, all right. So, so it's very, it's very Starfleet to think you can get the best out of somebody, right? So, or that you can bring back somebody that you cared about because you see parts of them in that other person. So I get the whole grabbing her at the end and bringing her back to prime universe. I think there definitely should have been much more of an outcry from, from Giorgio herself about being dragged to prime universe. Cause she was obviously pissed mm-hmm. like to her to die. There would have been honorable. It would have been, you know, I was the emperor who died. Now I'm the emperor who ran away. <laughs> which is gonna, it, everyone's going to hate. Everyone's going to think I'm a coward in, in my universe, which matters more to me than anything you think. And and at the end, I mean, really, you know, uh, I wish I had an excuse for this. It's terrible, but it's terrible, but it's like, it's like going after a, a big drug dealer, right? You let a lot of the little drug dealers go to get the big one. And that's true. And right now she's, she might be the emperor in, in mirror universe, but she's got no army in prime. So we have to beat the Klingons. And if we let her blow up the planet, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to win. And we're definitely not winning a Starfleet way. I think uh, well, I think there's a there's a deleted scene I think I've seen where they didn't put it in the episode and it would have been better if they had where she's sort of sitting at the bar in this area of Kronos um, sort of like drinking and getting drunk feeling pissed because she's sort of stuck there now and she's approached by a member of Section Thirty One I think it is yes I like yes. that idea I like that the Federation are going to use her milk her ruthlessness for its worth and that she's going to go on to do nefarious things but inside Starfleet. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that scene a lot. Um, we we actually spoke about it on a previous episode with Brandon, and th- he poked a bunch of holes in it, which make a lot of sense now. But I enjoyed <laughs> it overall. But we, the way we felt is that came that scene comes after the credits anyway, so it's fine yeah. that we got it later because it wouldn't have happened during any of the episodes. And that only makes sense because she seems like she's owning that club at that point, mm-hmm. and that was the yeah. same club she was. Yeah. That's the same club she was in when Tilly was getting high and all that. That was that was the same place. So apparently she's already gone back to her old ways of trying to grab power in little places and yeah. work her way up. And then so Starfleet kind of steps in like, no, 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 we're going to use you before you can get back at us is how right. I take it. So but we'll see. You know, she might double cross them at some point next season. and That would be great. I mean, not for Starfleet, but good TV. What did you guys think about the fact that she um, is like bisexual? Because it seems like all the women in the Mary universe are bisexual. <laughs> So <laughs> it's like I mean, mirror universe. They've got to be so sexually adventurous. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, so it doesn't bother me. I, I don't care. The only thing that bothers me is that, like you said, it's everyone in the mirror. Yeah. Universe. Mm-hmm. So it's almost as if th- they're saying, well, this is mirror universe is where bad stuff happens. This is bad. And that part is what bothers me because uh. they're all that way. You know what I mean? So, but outside of that, I mean, I'm probably just reading way too much into it. It's just, they just want to show them as extremely sexually permissive, uh, promiscuous, which I guess is, like if you're catering to like a teenage audience in that range, I guess that's a good <laughs> message, right? Don't sleep around. But but I don't know. I, it just doesn't bother me either way. I guess it just it just seems like they're making a negative out of that particular act, right? Because the norm of the mirror universe is that that it's bad, and so yeah, you're right. So all of these acts that are happening, you know, the stealing and the killing, killing and the murdering and the gaining power. Like even that idea of gaining power is because it's in the mirror universe is, is seen as a negative. And so being sexually open is because it's in the mirror universe is 
is seen as a negative, which, yeah, I don't like that. I'm fine being sexually open and I'm fine with gaining power and, you know, but I'm just, I don't know. So I, yeah, I don't like that we see it in the mirror universe. And so therefore it has this connotation of being negative. Right. Or at least that we see it so um, consistently across the mirror universe. Right. Look, if it's just to gain power, then Hey, whatever, it's just an act to gain power. And that's all it is. But it seems like, like you said, Claudia, it's like everybody in the mirror universe is that way, which is weird because I never thought of it before you said it either. I think it's also that in the mirror universe, people are using each other all the time. So they're using each other and like, they use the Kelpians as slaves and as a food source. And they also, you know, they use other people to do this and do that. So maybe the whole point is that they're using people for sexual pleasure. So maybe it's to show that they're just basically using people they don't right care now. right oh, they have, they, yeah yeah which now I'm, I'm fine with the scenes again mm-hmm. because that's if if it's just the fact that like i said it's just that they're they're uh, pr- promiscuous and that's that's the negative just being promiscuous then there's no problem with it um mm-hmm. and if it's just that they want to show that these people do this with no regards of feelings i'm also okay with that right you know yeah I but it is true that, that. I, and i never thought of it but everybody's that way right yep <laughs> yeah using just it it's just as sex as a tool yeah right and that, make, and that makes perfect sense for the mirror universe right it does because it's it's something <laughs> everyone has it right i mean you don't have to go buy something you don't have to make anything you just kind of have it so you can use it to your full advantage if if you so choose yeah yeah so um that deleted scene that came out oh, uh, refresh my memory why did we get to see that was that released from uh, it was released a couple weeks after the last episode. No. I don't remember why it was released. It was in an article, though, I believe. That they yeah. Were, they were talking about filming of the second season, and then they talked about how they had this scene, and it wasn't used. Um, And it was just the Section 31. And it, like we talked about it with Brandon. It was like his last and my first episode. That right. Was the transition that's right. Episode. Yeah. And, he, you know, it's kind of weird. They just kind of drop the comm badge and walk away, which is true. And I kind of fought with Brandon a little bit on that because I like the scene, so I was trying to defend it. But he's right. But um, it is nice. We did say it was nice that we got to see the black badge be tied directly to Section 31 and not not just that we're assuming it, which made all the sense in the world at the time. Yeah. And um, so looking forward, if we do see Mayor Giorgio, I want to see her in Section 31. Otherwise, I will not be happy. Like, I didn't even like her being brought back to the Prime Universe, but then that last clip, you know, it then that was like, okay, I'm going to be fine if we see her in the Section 31, because I think that, you know, we can use her there, and and there, to me, is a purpose, besides fulfilling Burnham's need to have her mother figure in her life. Yeah, I know? mean... At- this point we have to have her in in section 31 right because once they offered it the way they did if she says no they have to kill her wouldn't you think i i would hope so i hate to use the word hope but (laughs) (laughs) yeah because otherwise the way i take it is that they see she's starting to gain power here right so they're going to use it now if they're if they're worried enough about her to grab her and maybe look maybe i'm looking into it too deep again but if they're worried enough about her to try and grab her or think that she can fix a war that's not even going on anymore, technically, then yeah. I would worry that they were worried about her. They know she's from a mirror universe. They know what she did in that mirror universe. She, if she says no, she knows too much about Section 31 already just by knowing what the badges look like. She's got to go. I mean, leaving her on Kronos seemed like a bad idea, but then there's a lot of Terrible. there's a lot of dodgy stuff that happens in Discovery. So just the spore drive and the stuff that they're doing with the spore drive seems like a bad idea a lot of the time. And then also the fact that a lot of that's sanctioned. I mean, is it even sanctioned? I mean, because Lorca's involved, you know. But also oh, Ash right. Tyler, as soon as Surrey was like, I'm not going to take your freedom away, you know, Tyler. I'm like, why not? The man murdered <laughs> your, your your doctor. He murdered your doctor, which you kind of need in a time of war. And he's, you know, could you know switch to being a Klingon at any moment or whatever. I don't know. I, I think the fact that everybody sort of accepted him back again, and then everyone was urging Burnham, like, you know, come on, you have to be the bigger woman. You have to go and, like, make your peace with him and letting him wander around the ship and then, like, leaving him on Kronos. I'm like, these are some big security breaches. And I'm all in favor 
of like freedom, you know, morality, um, you know, like not putting people in prison, all that sort of stuff, maybe trying to rehab- rehabilitate people. But I just felt like this was going to later on down the line in Star Trek history, you know, it's going to backfire. <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely. So we, we, we actually talked a lot when we did the Volk Tyler one about this. And really, if they had just left the killing of Culber out, everything else about Tyler makes sense, right? But the killing of Culber ruins everything about everyone forgiving him, which I eventually had to admit to after about an hour of debating it. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't get me started. <laughs> but it, really, it's that one split second decision that they just kind of get over way too quickly. And, and isn't that what they did with Georgia at the end here? She's right. ready to blow up Kronos. She's ready to kill everybody and anyone to get that gets in her way. And, and they're just like, eh, go on, be happy. Yeah. Don't, don't do bad things now. You know, like it's so very, this age of star Trek for some reason, like the people in it. It's interesting at the very end that we see Amanda again, and I think Amanda wasn't needed for that scene. Amanda didn't have to be there. Uh, she could just talk to Sarek. I think it's a bit disturbing that Sarek was willing to sanction this horrible plan, but that's beside the point. Um, mm. And we see Amanda, and that's because Georgiou, Georgiou, is officially gone now, and Burnham needs another mother figure, or she needs her mother figure back, and so they're putting Amanda there as the mother figure. Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and Sarek refers to Amanda, Amanda as Burnham's mother, so, mm-hmm. in a way, it means that the, it sort of neatly ties up that arc so that Burnham right. doesn't have to go through into season two thinking and wishing and, like, sort of looking back at her relationship with George L. Yeah, that is a really good closure to that. So, all right, just I know this isn't about Sarek, but to touch on that real quick, I was not surprised at all he was able to convince himself that that was a good idea because – in his mind, well, you can you can figure out anything logically, right? You can use logic to defend anything. But the way I would have defended it if I was him was, we need to end this war. The Klingons are going to kill everybody. He already gave them the plan. You have to kill them before they kill you. So we knew that from the beginning that that was his belief, right? Punch them in the mouth early, and then they'll leave you alone. So in his mind, if we don't kill them now, we'll never be able to win. The, the humans will be wiped out, then the, then the Vulcans, then so on and so forth, and they'll just make their way to the galaxy, universe, whatever. So, but he could now hand a weapon off to somebody and go, not my problem. That's a mirror universe woman who did that. Not me. Mm. Hmm. That's how I'd look at it if I was him. Blood's on her hands, not mine. I just said, okay. It's quite logical. Yeah. Right. And that's why logic doesn't always work because I just logically figured out how to blow up an entire planet. Yeah. And a lot of leaders do use that type of Correct. tactic. Yeah, it's, it goes back to that idea that the mirror universe ruthlessness that everyone's exhibiting in the mirror universe will get the job done. That's, 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 that's the idea I think that Corn, um, Cornwall and um, Sarek have when they, you know, right. you know, when they meet Philippa and, and the Emperor. And they can, do it, they can do it without any of their own people having to suffer the consequences of doing something like that. Because let's be real, like, uh, you know, when, when Tilly and Burnham find out it's a bomb, ev- ev- their entire emotions change about the whole thing because, well, now they're somehow involved in the destruction of this planet. I like how at the very end, Burnham sort of looks around and she sees all the people in that part of Kronos and she sort of says, you know, this is an odd, strange place and it's not necessarily what I would have chosen. I'm paraphrasing. She says it better. But she says, this is a home and th- these are people here and this is their home. And it's that idea that just because a society or a culture is different than yours doesn't give you the right to pass judgment on it or to destroy it or conquer it and try and civilize it or whatever, you know. So in a way, the Federation is doing exactly what the Klingons had worried about way at the beginning of the series. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they are, but are they doing it as a, not are they doing it, it's wrong to do. Is it happening because of almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that the Klingons picked the fight which caused the problem that wouldn't have happened if the Klingons didn't pick the fight, or would the Federation have come eventually and done it anyway? 
Yes. I confused everyone. That's yes. a good question. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, if you followed any of that. <laughs> well, it's a bit like the undiscovered country, isn't it? Like the Klingons, that's a chance for the Federation to help the Klingons. And although quite a lot of people in the Federation do want to help the Klingons, there is that faction in Starfleet that are conspir- conspiring against them and thinking now is our chance to finally beat them down. This race of people who have been aggressive and at war with us for, you know, generations. So there's always going to be that side to the Federation and to Starfleet that is going to be more militaristic and is going to make the wrong choice, I think, at some point. But they do it with the founders as well, actually. They do it with the founders in Deep Space no, Nine. No, I, Don't they? They have no, that I, disease. I agree. Right. No, I agree. But what I'm saying is, so the, what the Klingons are seeing happening to them now is what they feared, Right. So, which justifies them going to war in the first place. But would it have happened had they not tried to go to war? Yeah, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. They might not have ever come to that. Although I, I think, yes, it would have come to that. But that's, I mean, if, if we're talking historically through our, you know, Earth's history, then yeah, it definitely would have come to it eventually. Yeah. And it's almost like the Klingons were giving the Federation the Vulcan hello. But... But it's it's definitely obvious now because they started the fight, so it created itself. Yeah, so that just sort of... So, yeah, I want to see her in, in Section 31, but I still want Starfleet to be my idealistic. And then if they're bringing in this Mir Giorgio and they're going to do whatever it takes, and then I look at, say, like Into Darkness and... You know, the Section 31 I did in uh, Warp 5, in Enterprise, you know, like, um, gosh, I don't want to see Section 31 get as bad as this dictatorship emperor that we see in the Mirror Universe, but I'm, I fear that's where it's going to go with her influence and her amazing and how, how adept she is at gaining power and control. I feel the exact opposite. Oh. I want it to get that bad. I, I want um, Section 31 to be basically horrendous. I mean, it can hold on to the ideal somewhat, but we don't think that special, you know, secret ops, are they're not clean. That's the whole point. If they were, you wouldn't have to do them behind closed doors. And you have to hide because they're not clean. So I don't want to see her go over there and become more Starfleety. That would suck. I don't want Starfleet to go bad, though. But it always has been. There's always been a Section Thirty One. You wouldn't be able to create. You wouldn't be able to create a, a civilization and keep it from the Romulans and the Klingons and everyone else if you didn't have somebody doing the dirty work. There has to be something bad in Starfleet to contrast with the good. Do you see what I'm saying? So there has to be something bad in, in order for us to actually say this is not the Starfleet ideals in order to introduce the Starfleet ideals to the audience. So the audience has to see how bad things can be in order to really appreciate the good and the moral characters in Starfleet. Oh, I have, I have another take on that. Okay. <laughs> so I think that this whole show is the bad. Mm. Uh, at the end of all this, whenever this finally wraps up and closes up, we obviously never hear the spore drive again, right? We never hear Lorca again. We never hear Burnham again. We don't hear of any of these people in TNG, um, uh, D Space Nine, or uh, Voyager, or ever again, or any of the movies. They're never referenced. And obviously, that's because they didn't know they were going to make this show. But more importantly, we don't hear about them because something has to happen to hide this technology. Mm-hmm. And it has to be that this is the negative that eventually Section 31 realizes it has to hide from the rest of Starfleet in order to move forward into Kirk and Picard and so on and so forth. Isn't the idea that the spore drive and the way they're using the mycelium, a mycelium network actually going to damage these sort of space mushrooms? Like that? I took that as no, that the way the emperor in the mirror universe was using them was going to do that. Oh, okay. Cause I was thinking, was there an ecological, ecological message here in the sense that they have to get rid of the spore drive technology because it is going to actually damage the fabric of the universe. Like they got a little bit too technologically advanced and it's going to actually cause chaos. So they have to well, stop using it or. Right. There's a possibility that they could worry that future generations will come up with the same technology that George O had. 
but the current the way I read it, the current the discovery is not doing it. It was the mirror universe that was doing it. Amazingly, again with this whole universe next to each other, nobody else but those two have spore drives of any kind. <laughs> right. So I'm sort of thinking that uh, that the mycelium network was definitely used in mirror when Lorca came, and we don't know exactly. Well, or do we know exactly when, how long he's been in the Prime? Uh, do they tell us when the original Lorca's ship explodes? Yeah, I think I, they did. And I yes. didn't look it up. So, so, but, so the mycelium network is destroyed in the mirror and it's getting so bad that it destroys the Prime mycelium network as well. And so the last little thing we see is the one little green or blue, you know, that falls on Tilly's shoulder. Like, so it's wiped out. So I, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that's why we don't hear about it is because it's gone now because of how the mirror universe used it and destroyed it. And yeah, that whole, you know, green and recycled. Yeah, but use we replaced. still would have heard about Lorca and Burnham and the major details on the war, the ship disappearing for nine months. And we never hear about any of it. So I, I just, I don't know. I just think that this is the bad that Starfleet tries to avoid later. And that would tie in with the Enterprise in the original series being the more sort of Federation ideal, wouldn't it, really? Um, my worry is in season two of Discovery, they're going to somehow paint Captain Pike as some sort of, I don't know, some sort of bad character. That's my worry. So they're going to take... Lunatic. Yeah, yeah. Is it Captain Pike? It's Captain Pike, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yes. They're going to take him or they're going to take something. They're going to somehow create conflict between the Enterprise and Starfleet. I don't know. I'm like, just please make sure that you don't make them evil. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that, that Enterprise was dumped in there for fan service. It's going to start at the next season and fly away and we'll never see it again. So <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about it. I mean, it's still yeah, going to be called cool Discovery, I, I isn't it? So. so it's going to be centered on Discovery. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So the, obviously, the spore drive's not gone. Yeah. We Why? don't need to follow the. If it is, we don't need to follow the ship anymore. We can we can abandon this whole idea and get on a regular ship and go trampsing around the universe. No, we can have discovery without the spore drive. <sighs> what a waste of a ship! <laughs> well, I would well, dismantle then that what thing would in a heartbeat. Be doing? I don't know. Well, I would dismantle that thing in a heartbeat. Think about it. Most of the power in that stupid thing is to get that dish to spin around that way. <laughs> the, the, the dish spin a, does the dish spin around when they go to warp? It's only when they they only when they use drive. the spin drive. Yeah, it spins you know in a round, and then it spins around the then the whole thing flips upside down a few times. Every time yeah. I see that, I have a mental image in my head of everybody like flipping upside down inside <laughs> of the ship, and like people's like <laughs> soup bowls of soup flying up in the air, and tea going <laughs> everywhere, and people being like. Damn, it was black alert again. I was right in the middle of my nachos. You know, nachos are all over the ceiling and in people's hair and stuff. But it's almost like the anomalies in Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But obviously oh. everyone's still in their seats. It's very disappointing. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> just ridi if I was the captain and I knew you were having a bowl of cereal and I wanted to mess with you, I'd just go to black alert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the last bowl of Captain Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well we should get back on track it's been <laughs> so yeah so Giorgio has to destroy the discovery that's what I'm saying here mm. <laughs> or at least it's memory or she has to do something so crazy that kind of like Starfleet resets itself completely that's a possibility too you know I don't I don't see why you're hung up on that we never hear about them. How many thousands of ships have we never heard of? Uh, you're right. Or their crew, or their, like, you're right, Discovery isn't the Enterprise. It's not the flagship of the Federation. This is just some little ship, like Voyager, you know, that's just out there doing its business. Like, we don't hear of every single ship and every single first officer and science officer from that. So, this is Discovery. This is another ship in the Federation that, yeah, of course, we've never heard because we're following the flagships. I bet they abandoned the Spore Drive because it can take you to the Mirror Universe. I bet you that's why yeah, they abandoned it. That, that didn't work out for them. Because I, 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 bet, <laughs> I, bet, I bet they say, like, 
because they do, obviously they don't want be. us going to the mirror. I say us like we're in Starfleet. They don't want yes. people going to the mirror universe. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's why they keep hiding it each time, yeah. and nobody ever remembers, and they end up there going, "What's this place?" But um, no, and it does, but it does bother me because seeing, not hearing about, it, why it shouldn't say it bothers me. I understand why we don't hear about it, but I'm hung up on it because it did some things that were unbelievable. It actually started to turn the war. We know about the USS Intrepid, right? That I mean, we know about big naval ships that did things like that, even if they we weren't necessarily the ones to win the wars, or they didn't have. The, the five star captains on them or whatever you know what i mean like yeah i so, see your so point those major points are just kind of like wiped away the, and the fact that no one's ever like hmm i wonder if the spore drive ever you know if the spores ever built themselves back up it's only been 200 years let's check like it never happens yeah i can see your point i can see your point i mean it did the discovery did do some historical events if you will, large enough to be recorded. I would, right. And yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's not like the end of the world if they never mentioned it. I just think it would be nice if at the end they wrap this up with a reason why. Mm-hmm. I also understand that that might not happen at all and I've got to get over it. I guess that's the problem with prequel prequels, isn't it? Yes. So you don't have that issue if you do sequels. And that's why I was kind of surprised that they chose to do a prequel. And one of the reasons why I was also surprised as well is because there's a almost there's almost a war between the Klingons and the humans in the original series, and Kirk and the Enterprise managed to prevent it. And so I was like, I didn't realize there was gonna there was a there was a war with the Klingons before that. So they've introduced an actual big conflict in which millions of people have died. So that's that's a big change in Star Trek history. And so I was a little bit, I was like, how is that going to work? And I, I was surprised they didn't do a sequel like after Voyager. Yeah, I I, I probably would have liked a sequel a lot. But I, I, I mean, I don't mind a prequel. And it's been the last two iterations of Star Trek where they really killed off millions of people, right? Because right. See, they start off season three or the end season two of Enterprise with killing millions yeah, that's true. Right. of 17 million people, uh, you know, along the eastern seaboard of North and South America. Mm-hmm. Which makes the next generation even more of a utopia because by the time you reach next generation there's been earth's involvement in space travel um and in international space i say international intergalactic politics has been pretty awful really if you think about it for for humans so by the time they reach the next generation it's like when picard's saying stuff like you know we're all at peace with each other and there's no, no one worries about money and we all we all respect each other i'm like Guys, you did it. You got there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're finally there. Oh, Deep Space Nine show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> almost. You almost got there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, and Picard just stayed on the other side of the quadrant so he didn't have to see any of it. He was like, no, nah, we're great. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're good. No, we all love each other. <laughs> There's no conflict. <laughs> I'm done. Too old for this. <laughs> all right, guys, give me your final thoughts of Captain. Or Emperor Philippa Giorgio, Clara. So my final thoughts are that she is um, a really interesting character. I think it's sad that she died quite early on because I would like to see more of her character. But I think that that had to happen in order to introduce her mirror counterpart. And I, th- I, I love the contradiction and the contrast, but also the similarities between her mirror counter- counterpart and her prime person. And I do think it does sort of symbolise this internal conflict in star trek itself about you know what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do in order to achieve an end goal or aim so yeah i think i think she's a great character yeah patrick all right so i mean i I pretty much feel very similar the only difference um or not difference the thing i'll add to it is i'm hoping in season two that we actually get and this is unlike everybody else who watches the show i hope we get a pretty decent section 31 arc because i want to see her rise through section 31 and get into a semi, at least semi decent uh, position of power over the next couple of seasons, you know, willing that we have a couple of seasons to go, but I would like to see her move through the ranks and I'd like to see her story arc in section 31 and how that shapes section 31 going forward, because I think she could have a, a huge impact on the way section 31, you know, ends up. So um, I'm just hoping we get that, but I, I do agree with everything else. I, I loved uh, captain. I loved mirror. Um, the actress is amazing to be able to pull off both of those because 
you had to play them perfect in order for them to be believable. You, they had to be completely different and exactly the same all at the same time. And that's not an easy thing to do for anybody, you know, at all. So for her to pull it off and us not to be sitting here going, oh, that was just terrible. is amazing. So, and that's my final thoughts on her. Yeah, I agree completely with what you both have said. And going on with what you said, Patrick, like her playing the prime, we got to see uh, Michelle Yeoh's action uh, when she was fighting the Klingons on the Scargophagus ship. And then we get to see her uh, in the mirror when she's fighting Lorca, like those amazing moves and how talented she is with all of her fight scenes and her tenderness with Burnham in both universes and her command. And when she enters a room, like she owns it. And we see that in both universes and just ever so slightly different that makes a difference between her prime and mirror universe counterparts. Um, I love seeing this strong and independent woman who is taking advice you know, from her crewmates and making the decision and going with her morals in the prime and then conversely not in the mirror. I just think it's so great. Um, and I do, I'm interested to see what we see in season two. If she is used as section 31, I'll be happy. If, if she isn't, then I won't be, but I'm very, uh, I, I think she is a great character that we got to start out and end the season one with. So it's it made for a very nice arc for that. All right. Well, Clara, thank you so much for joining us on The Edge. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yes. And where can people find you here on the network? So you can find me on Primitive Culture, which is a podcast that I do with my co-host Duncan Barrett, which examines um, our history and um, our culture and how it's had an impact on Star Trek and how Star Trek's had an impact on it. And you can also find me on Twitter um, at Clara Jean MC and also talking on the Babel Conference on Facebook. It's been fun talking about Captain Giorgio today, but this isn't the only thing we've been discussing on the network. Here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM. To the journey! Yeah, I don't see him being allowed to just mooch off of Voyager, which is what he'd be doing if he resigned his commission. Be like, okay, get out. <laughs> we'll find the next planet and drop So it's kind out. of an empty threat. I'm going to resign my commission. Like, fine, you want to go scrub the plasma manifolds? Knock yourself out. <laughs> Someone has to do it. Might as well be you. <laughs> Warp 5. DeLorean? I'm terrible with names, let me just hey, tell you. just like Back to the Future, man. DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've now you ruined son- it. Yep, you see his son, the DeLorean. Doors open this way. No, so, but in well, that episode, we see ears. his son. He does. <laughs> Maybe he could fly. I don't know. Now that should be the stinger. Earl Grey. Was that Jellicoe that went by? What are you talking about? Will you stop finding things in this episode that no one else sees. <laughs> the guy had gray hair and everything. I thought it was Jellicoe. Oh yeah, because every guy with gray hair is Jericho. Like yeah, yeah. Like he's, he, he, he's just visiting after coming by for <laughs> chain of command. He was stopping for a cup of tea. <laughs> he doesn't strike me as someone that drinks tea. Melodic treks. Oh, okay. So how do we do this? I mean, wait a minute. Before we get into that, like, what about like the Tarantino Trek movie? Is that going to happen? Because I'm totally stoked for that. Oh yeah. Listen, he's done two movies already. Whoa. And. Uh, have to the car wow, because that be that'll be great well i'm so very excited that we're going to be getting two tarantino movies that's that's just awesome this, this is great i love knowing about the future you know what we'll, we'll set up that interview with jeff russo let's get the next episode of melodic tracks back online and let's make it happen we're making it happen brandon oh but here's the best part i have a copy of the interview right here, already mixed and ready to go. And you can put it online when I leave. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. 
check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcast. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's shows, and there's many ways for you to do that. The best place to join the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select the edge. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at TrekFM and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash TrekFM. So, Amy, where can people find you when you're not buying up uh, strip clubs to try and take power and get into Section 31? Well, I am doing that a little on the side here in Vegas, so it will be... No, just kidding. <laughs> Good place for it. <laughs> exactly, right? Well, you can find me here on the network. I uh, co-host... Earl Gray, which is our uh, podcast all about Next Generation, and I do that with Richard and Justin. You can find me on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson. I'm currently uh, tweeting about my Deep Space Nine watch. I'm very excited to be doing that for the 25th anniversary, but my favorite place is right there in the Babel Conference. So, Patrick, where can people reach you when you're not ruling the Mirror Universe? Well, when I'm not doing that, I pop up in the Babel conference, but it's, it's so, I'm so busy ruling the mirror universe that I don't get much time to be there, but I will, you can find me, uh, over my friends, Brandon and, and uh, Brandy at warp five. And you can find me on Twitter at, uh, magic drop five. It's one word, but the five is a number. And I pop up, like I said, in the Babel conference, but it's just not that often. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd also like to thank our special uh, Section 31 operatives, Norman C. Lau, Tony Robinson, Thomas Puleo, Lisa Slack, Joab Mirza, Richard Rutch- Rutledge, James Muldrow, Cornelia Reutner, Thank you for supporting Trek FM and The Edge and Section 31. Thank you for listening and join us next time to see what's happening on The Edge of Federation Space. Mm-hmm.